me here. What a change that is. Um, now, this passage, we've seen this coming for weeks, haven't we? Uh, it's, it's a passage we need to treat gently, and we know that we find these concepts difficult. So let's pray for God's help as we come to it. Our Father in heaven, thank you that you have lots to say to us today. And we pray, Father, that you would speak to us now through your Bible so that we would actually know you and live for you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, here we go then with our talk from that passage. Uh, we don't have Bibles uh, to share out in the church building because of restrictions, but I'll put the verses on the screen that you guys need to look at as we get to them. So, in what situations do you most glorify God, do you think? In what situations? Maybe, you know, when you come to church, maybe when you're watching the live stream. To put it another way, um, where's the greatest battleground to be a Christian? Might it not actually be not being here on a Sunday or watching here on a Sunday, or even in our daily quiet time that we might find challenging to do, but might not the biggest battleground be in our everyday lives at home, at work, with other people? We've been seeing in Ephesians that Christians are like billboards. We're like billboards to God's glory, to the universe showing God's greatness. His intent was that now through the church, that's us, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. It doesn't get much bigger than that, does it? We glorify God to the universe. And that's because God's people trusting in Jesus, the church, are united together, very different people, in Jesus. And it glorifies God that that could happen, because that would never happen but for Jesus. And so we saw last week how desperately we need God's help. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we said. God himself, not in a kind of one-off experience, but in an ongoing, keep on going with God as he keeps working, filling our lives, so that in all of our lives, every bit of it, we glorify God as his united people. So today's passage is all about the home, it's all about everyday life in the home, marriage, children, slaves, or we'll see slaves are a bit like employees these days, because this is the real battleground. Working at unity in the everyday stuff really glorifies God. And here's the shock for us in the 21st century. Unity that glorifies God will involve submission. There you go, I said it submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now that sounds very archaic, doesn't it? And it even sounds a bit oppressive to us with our 21st century ears. Uh, last Saturday, I got to marry Aaron and Elizabeth. It was a like, highlight of, the, of lockdown, I think, really. Um, uh, but we had to choose the alternative vows for their marriage because even the default vows for marriage do not include the idea of submission. You have to choose the alternative ones. And we can understand why, can't we? There has been so much oppression of women in particular over centuries, and we are really sensitive to any hint of oppression, inequality. But what we're gonna see in the Bible is not some kind of ugly domination, but a beautiful thing, a partnership. So, so please bear with me and listen to what God is actually saying, not what you think he might be saying. And also remember that the real shock for the people first hearing this was not submission. They were very comfortable with the idea that people have to submit. What is shocking for them is that the person uh, who was, um, yeah, the other party, was actually supposed to really love and care for the one doing the submitting, not just kind of dominate them and take advantage of them. In other words, this is God's solution to a kind of power play. This is his solution. Now also I know this is really hard to hear today for those who crave marriage and are not married, or for those who are in unhappy marriages, 
or separated marriages. I hope you will see today that marriage, well, it isn't everything, and it is hard, but also that, that you will want Christian marriage to actually really flourish. Okay, let's get on with it, shall we? So we dealt earlier with, um, with parents and children, didn't we? Just as well, otherwise I'd be going on literally all day. So that's good. We've done the first one, uh, children and parents. Uh, we're going to deal with slave and, slaves and masters and wives and husbands now. And we're going to deal with slaves and masters first. So this is what the Bible says. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. Now, don't be put off. The Bible is not pro-slavery anything the Bible is anti-slavery. Uh, Paul, who wrote Ephesians, put slave traders alongside murderers in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, but it was a fact, slavery was a fact, and so Paul says, you know, given that there is slavery, this is how you should behave. It's also worth saying that most slavery in Paul's day was a bit more like everyday employment is to us, actually. About a third of the population, probably, were slaves. That's a lot of people, isn't it? And they were often very well treated. They often had secure positions and important, proper jobs. Some of them were even doctors. So this is not the kind of slavery we think of with slave traders and all that kind of thing. What's the teaching? Well, slaves are told to obey their masters. And we kind of think, oh, yeah, well, that's a bit obvious, isn't it? Of course, they have to obey their masters. They're slaves. Why bother saying that, Paul? Well, his reason why they should obey is very, very different to the world. He says, with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favour when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Often I think we think as Christians, you know, yeah, I know, it's right, it's right that I obey my boss, so I'm going to obey my boss with all my might, but I really don't want to. But this standard is much higher, isn't it? This standard is sincerity of heart. It is real obedience, not begrudging obedience. And it's not because your boss is more important than you, or more worthy than you, or deserves more respect than you, just like we saw with parents and children, but you obey your boss as you would obey Christ, as slaves of Jesus, in other words. You do it for him. Now, often as Christians, we think, oh yeah, I'll do that, I'll do that, and then I'll be noticed by my boss, and then I'll glorify Jesus, and that'd be really great, won't it? Well, that's true, but that's not what Paul says here. He says, obey them all the time, even when you're not noticed because you are still serving Jesus, even then. Now, we've all had bosses that are hard to work for, let alone respect, maybe. Now, this teaching is really about households, don't forget. That's where slaves were. They were in the household. And that's really what God's talking about, that he wants unity in the household, because it glorifies him. But I think we can still apply it to workplaces as well, because obedience in the workplace creates unity and unity glorifies God because it's different. It's different when we do it for Jesus. Now, again, just like with parents, the real challenge is not for slaves. The real challenge to the first hearers was to the slave masters, to the bosses of today. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he who's both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him in a christian home masters should treat slaves as if they're serving the same master as if they are under jesus together rather than just some kind of power play between you and those who are your subordinates in other words, this is, this is not thinking you're more important than your subordinates, because all of us are saved by grace. We're saved by Jesus' death for our sins, not because we're better, 
And you really know that when you're in Jesus. So let's remember how this works, okay? Imagine, um, oh, he's going to like this, I think. Imagine this is a boss, all right? Phil, who's playing the music today. Imagine this is the boss, and uh, these are his subordinates, right? David and Emma, who are not doing the music today. They're going to regret not doing the music today. Um, imagine that, all right? Now, imagine this is Jesus. Remember, the gold envelope. When you trust in Jesus, you are placed, all of you, you are placed in Jesus. And now you are united to Jesus. You're in him. And you're not alone, are you? Because you're in him with other people of different statuses to you. And so you can't be kind of thinking your status is higher than theirs, you're more important than them, you're more deserving than them. No, because you're all in Jesus together. You're all saved not because you're good. You're saved from your sins by his blood on the cross. And that makes all the difference. It means there's no superiority in Jesus. Now, of course, our workplaces, they're not Christian households, are they? So it's a little bit different because not everyone there is in Jesus, probably. But this still applies. Harsh and threatening behaviour, that disunites, doesn't it? It creates division and it creates tension. It is a power play. And it's not going to glorify God. It's not going to dis display that we're his changed people. And we need to watch this. Maybe you don't think you need to watch this. Maybe you don't have any employees working for you. What about suppliers? What about contractors in your home as well as in your workplace? How do you treat them? We're not to have some kind of power play going on. It does not glorify God. Can you see how in a simple everyday life we can glorify God or not? Okay, well, let's cut to the chase because I think that the biggest area that Paul's talking about where we can create unity or disunity in a Christian house is, is marriage, is the third one, wives and husbands. And we see the same pattern, which is submission and love, voluntary submission and love applies. Not a power play, in fact, the very opposite of a power play. Now, before we get into this, we need to say that God has always seen women and men as equal in status and in value, right from the very beginning of the Bible. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them, both women and men, made in the image of God, both equal both having huge dignity, made in the image of God. Wow. And of course, we've just seen everyone in Christ is also having an equal status in salvation. So if you're Christian husbands and wives, you have the same status in Jesus too. But this doesn't mean that submit is a dirty word just because you are equal. Remember God the Son, Jesus, submitted to God the Father, and yet they are both God, aren't they? They are equals. Especially look at the Garden of Gethsemane if you want to see that in full effect. That was submission, but not submission because one being more worthy than the other. Let's see what the Bible says. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now notice again, it's not submit to your husband because he's more important than you, or because he's more worthy than you. No, out of service to Jesus. And notice too, it is voluntary. It's not coerced by the husband. It's wanting to obey Jesus his pattern for marriage, of having a head in marriage. And look, look what it's modelled on. Now, as the church, that's us, submits to Christ, to Jesus, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Now, we don't submit to Jesus out of sheer terror, do we? Or grudging hatred 
No, we, we obey him as a loving saviour who died for us, who gave himself up on the cross for our sins so we can be forgiven. We submit to him as one who wants the best for us. And that is how a wife is being asked to submit to her husband, trusting his care of her. Forgive me for a minute talking about my own marriage. It is beautiful that Catherine wants my lead in our family as the head of the family. It's beautiful. It's beautiful that she's not always trying to usurp me or manipulate me or the situation to get her own way. It's beautiful. It's beautiful that she really wants my input in decisions that she wants actually me to be responsible with her for decisions. It's beautiful that she leaves many decisions on like our diary, our family diary, or, uh, or big purchases until we can actually talk to each other about it because she wants me involved. It is beautiful. I find it beautiful. And it's even more beautiful when on the rare occasions that we discuss things and we still fine, we don't agree, very, very rarely, that Catherine actually says, okay, well, we'll just go with what you think, actually, Ben. It reduces conflict by doing that, doesn't it? Because we've actually come to, a, come to a solution. It creates unity. And of course, if I'm actually being the head I should, then what I think is the best way should actually be the best thing for Catherine, shouldn't it? Not just for myself. We're going to see that in a minute. Now, we don't do this perfectly. We really don't. Uh, no one who's here or who's watching does. But it is our aim, and it is different, because many married couples live such disunited lives, actually. Many married couples actually operate as individuals, because that is the only way they can get what they want with their time, or with their money, or with their priorities. And the Bible says, be different. Wives, submit to the loving lead of your husband and be united. Be a, the beautiful unity that will glorify God. Now, I know there's going to be lots of questions about that, and we can't really answer them all right now. Uh, we would do in marriage prep, as we did with Aaron and Elizabeth. Uh, we must say, of course, there are obviously times when submission is not right. In fact, it's wrong. Uh, that, that would be, for example, when it's to go against what God says in the Bible, or when there's violence involved, or when there's abuse involved, of course. But let's major on the main principle here, not the exceptions, which is about accepting our God-given roles. Unity in marriage creates unity in the home, and it glorifies God because it displays his amazing wisdom that this could ever happen between two people, frankly. Okay, that's the wives. Husbands, don't think you've got off lightly. Um, in fact, your role is probably even harder, or you've not really understood it. Uh, this is what the Bible says. Husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, this would have been a real shock in Paul's day in a culture that viewed marriage as basically a power play between the important one and the non-important one. Husbands able to kind of lord their power over their wives. This would be a real shock. And you expect Paul to say, hey, husband's the head, so husbands, lead your wives. What does Paul actually say? Lead your wives? No, husbands, love your wives. And how much? As much as Jesus giving up his life on the cross for his people. That is quite a lot, isn't it? And why did he do it? To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Beautiful, really, isn't it? Jesus, he loved enemies, people who were sinners against God, against himself, basically, and he came to earth to die on a cross for their sake so that he could set aside those people as his own forever. And he makes us clean by washing us with his message of salvation and forgiveness. That's the Bible message. 
And he does it so that one day we can appear with him in his kingdom, perfect, beautiful. That is how much Jesus loves us. And husbands, that's how much you are to love your wives. That's how you're to lead your wives. I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? For the good of your wives, in other words. Now, our problem as husbands is often selfishness, really. And that's often where disunity comes from. You know, we selfishly try and get our own good by being harsh or angry or domineering. Or we selfishly just check out of the relationship. We abdicate our responsibility, just let our wife rule, just let our wife make all the decisions, just let our wife have sole responsibility for the children. It's selfish, isn't it? Imagine instead a husband who gives up his golf trips, who gives up his Saturday morning football to be with his wife and his family, who involves himself in the family, who who gives them time, who comes home from work on time for the sake of the family, who shares the chores, who shares all the money in joint names and a joint account, who takes an interest in all the decisions, not just says, whatever you think, darling. Imagine a husband who makes sure his wife gets time every day to read the Bible and to pray. Imagine a husband who makes sure his wife is not too tired to go to Bible study or to go to church. Imagine a husband who actually speaks to his wife about her faith and cares for how she's growing. How difficult would it be to submit to a husband like that? Do you see how beautiful the pattern is? How beautiful this uniting could be that glorifies God. Now, husbands and wives here and watching at home, we are all failures on that standard, aren't we? That is why we need to be filled with the Spirit all the time, ongoing, every day, God's continual filling filling of us and helping us to obey him in everything. If marriage is a struggle for you, other people can help you with that. Uh, Please tell me if that is the case and we can either help you or get someone to help you with that. Our marriages are meant to display Jesus, aren't they? It's big. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking not about marriage, about Christ and the church. What? Marriage was invented by God for a bigger purpose. It was always supposed to be a picture of Jesus and his people being united in one flesh, one body, total commitment, total security. And that's really, really important because it means if you never marry, you can still have the real deal. You can still have what the picture points to, being united to Jesus forever. You can still have that. It also means if you are married, well, your marriage is important, but it is not everything. Don't expect your marriage to deliver perfection. It is a picture of the real deal when we love our wives and and submit to our husbands. It isn't actually the real deal. And so can you see where you most glorify God? It is in everyday life. It is in being a parent or a child, you glorify God there. It is being a a boss or an employee, you glorify God there. It is being a husband or a wife, you glorify God there. This beautiful unity that God wants, it displays him to the universe because it's different. And friends, how we need God's help, because we're all such failures at this. So let's pray now for God's help that he would continually fill us with his spirit 
to do this. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for helping us to hear something very, very countercultural. This idea of submission and loving care, which actually creates unity. Father, please help us to hear this deep in our hearts with soft hearts. And please, Father, change us to be those who voluntarily, willingly submit and love, really care for, sacrificially each other. Whether we're married, whether we are employees, whether we are parents and children, we pray for your help that you would keep on filling us and leading us by your spirit to do this so that we glorify you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jacob.